Hi everyone, welcome back to the Casual Watch Review channel. So in this week's episode, I am lucky enough to be interviewing Spencer, who's well known in the Seiko community for lovingly repairing and restoring vintage Seiko watches. So thank you so much for joining me. Uh, always happy to be here. So I've got a, a couple of questions that um, I wanted to ask you and also some that were sent in by subscribers. So first off, the important one, would you like to tell us a bit about yourself and how you got started? Uh, well, I am, um, uh, I am, I'm a professional watchsmith. I restore vintage watches. I specialize in vintage Seiko, uh, because I really love vintage Seiko, but I'm a big fan of all vintage, uh, watches, really all watches, really. I mean, I'm wearing a modern watch right now, but, um, I got into this because, uh, I couldn't find many, many years ago, I couldn't find anybody to do work for me to a level that I thought was acceptable. Um, mm -hmm. And so I began training myself and getting being tutored and, you know, poking around until I could work on my own watches. Uh, because what's nice about doing your own work is that if the mechanic screws up, he's, you don't have to go far to yell at him. Yeah. Um, and so, but then we, it sort of grew and grew from being a hobby to friends of mine in the hobby, begging me to work on their watches. So I started doing that and it was taking more and more and more time. And so eventually my wife just said, you should do this for a living and uh, you need to start charging money. And I started doing that, not to make money off of it, but to um, basically, I, I didn't want to be buried. It was taking up so much of my time. And then it just it morphed into being a business. And so this has been my full-time job now since uh, to the very beginning of 2013. I, I know you said you, you work on many watches, but why the focus on, on Seiko in particular? I, I've always been interested in machines and uh, the resurrection of machines. I, uh, I've always had a problem where I sort of anthropomorphize machines and they're like little lost animals to me. And I love the whole idea of bringing these old forgotten things back to life. Now, I don't know if that's innate, something I was born with or something I learned. I certainly would have learned it. This is a um, picture of my dad and me when I was little. Oh, wow. And so my father was frugal. And he, if he could keep a machine running himself, he would do it. And he also, he hated paying someone else to do anything. So he would do it himself. And so I grew up with my dad, you know, working on machines and doing all this stuff. He also, he loved Volkswagens and he loved um, old British cars. And so I grew up, I learned to drive in a 1960 Volkswagen. I'm um, looking for, here's a picture of my dad and me when I was probably about 17. Oh, wow. And so that green car that he's sitting, standing next to, yep. that was my high school car. I still have a piece of that car. A lady totaled it. She ran, uh, it was a snowy day and she ran a stop sign and sideswiped me. Uh, and I still have pieces of that car. But those, that's a, the green one's a 63 and a black one's a 59. And they were, I, I grew up with my dad, you know, working on these, uh, working on these cars. Let me see if I can find this picture. Here's a picture of me working on a white one. I'm in the back of <laughs> the VW and I'm busy trying to weld it. My girlfriend at the time took this photograph because she was angry that I spent all my time working on cars and not squiring her around. <laughs> and she took the picture to prove it. Um, I was also really into, for the same reason, I was really into Vespa scooters. Uh, I'm looking for a picture here. Hang on. Uh, I just, I've always loved vintage machines. This was my very first Vespa. That was my 1974 Rally 200. At one point, I had, I think, 17 scooters. Wow. Because they were so cheap. Yeah. I, I could get, I could get them for, I could get them for, God, for a few hundred dollars. This Vespa right here, this, this P200, I found at a yard sale in San Francisco. and I think I paid a hundred dollars for it, but I completely rebuilt this. I mean, I did everything to this scooter to, to bring it back to life. This is another example. This car had been semi-abandoned. This is a, that's a 1960 Thunderbird, completely original, and I bought that car had been sitting for years dead. It had a short behind the dash, and I fixed it and and I bought it for twelve hundred dollars. Didn't have a speck of rust, and I drove that car. I drove that car for years, and I just I just loved all of this. I loved the technology, the old technology, the time travel aspect of it, bringing these old dead machines back to life. Here's a, that's a 1971 or 1972 BMW motorcycle. Yeah. And that was a lot of fun, you know, and it's just, it's just great stuff. It's great fun. And so 
I'm married now, so I don't really, obviously I've been married for a long time and I don't get to play around with motorcycles and I'm not on anything with two wheels. And, but that drive and desire was still there. And then I found Seiko and I, it was like the same world opened up in front of me, just very small. Yeah. And, uh, uh, and your hands stay a bit more clean. <laughs> yeah, they do. They do. Um, and Seiko, I just, I love their aesthetic. I love the sort of, especially during their golden age, which is like about 1964 to about 1988. Uh, and they did, they, they did so many amazing things in terms of technology and their aesthetic design was great. I mean, they, they were world beaters. Seiko did so many amazing things. But what I loved about them is they, you could get this incredible tech and these lovely watches. You could get them for very, very little. And, uh, and they were fun to work on as a result. I didn't have to worry about, you know, really doing any, I, I, I could work on them with confidence even when I was beginning because they were inexpensive and I could, if something was wrong with the movement, you could find many more and that was easy. And so, and I've just, Seiko has always rewarded me for working on it. Um, and plus it's so fun to talk about with other people and to make them aware of it. I don't know. It's just fun. It's just literally, it's all fun. If nobody paid me, I would still do this. When you repair these watches, are the parts quite easy to come by? I imagine. No, they're quite hard to come by, uh, depending on what it is. Like eBay is full of vintage Seiko movements, tons of them. Um, and you can get a lot of them. I actually, I had somebody just ship me two full medium flat rate boxes, completely full of watches for free. Because they just didn't want them anymore. I, I I must have added another 70 or 80 watches to my parts things. But they were almost all the same model. That said, a lot of them are going to have the same problems. So the parts that you really need, like a balance or escape wheel or mainspring or something else like that, in all of the watches, they're all going to be in the same kind of condition. So you can't just pull them out. So you do have to find new things, even with all these old parts. A large part of my day and week is spent hunting for parts i always have inquiries out and if i find some weird parts house and they have a stash of something um and i've done all this work to find it i'll buy all of them because in a lot of cases the parts house themselves doesn't even know they have it for the most part Seiko stopped making all parts for the watches i work on they stopped making parts of them 30 years ago so it's 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 very hard to find. So I have a lot of parts, but there's not an infinite supply. Yeah. So there's not any kind of like third party companies that have set up like similar to like vintage cars where you get other people trying to make the parts for them. No. Yeah. No. With Seiko, that's something um, that's really interesting. There really never was a second party maker. Like with Swiss watches, you could get in back in the day, there were companies like Best Fit and these other things, and they would make replacement parts. They would make replacement staffs, and they would be generics that were fine. Nobody ever made anything for Seiko that wasn't Seiko. So even if it's packaged for Best Fit, it was made by Seiko. Wow. What, what um, kind of advice would you have for new collectors of, this, of Seiko? The biggest thing to be careful of is reworked watches. Um, there's a lot of them in the world. A ton of them went to... Uh, like Southeast Asia, places like that, where they were beaten to death in the hot sun, hot, humid, and the watches are junk. And there's an entire cottage industry down there of returning these watches to some semblance of life and then selling them to unwary newcomers who then, they're, the, what they're getting is junk. And there are rules that I have followed. I've been on eBay, my, my main account, for just shy of 20 years. And these these rules have never failed me. So when it comes to Buying vintage Seiko, the first thing is you have to know what you're looking for. But you can minimize your risk if you limit the scope of your search to essentially the United States, Japan, and Australia. If you do that, that's a good first step. The second step is if you are able to look at a vintage Seiko, I always buy them when they're unrestored. But you look, at, you look for an unrestored original watch and you look for it, you want it to be dirty. You ideally want to have it have a scratched crystal because you don't want anyone to have ever been messed with it. Um, I, I always I, I prefer to buy from people who are not watch people, somebody who cleans out estates, somebody who gets stuff at thrift stores. I don't want a watch person. I don't want fancy photographs. I don't want a glitzy description. I don't want a pleasant disclaimers. I want a, a relatively good, clear picture of a dirty, original, old Seiko with a scratch crystal. 
and I want to look through that scratch crystal and see white loom. Because if we see white loom, Seiko loom is reactive to moisture. And so it's, it's like a, it's, it, that's accidental, but it's like the canary in the coal mine. And so if you look through and you see white loom inside your vintage Seiko, that means water didn't get in, most likely. And so if you see clean, unfaded colors on the dial, if you see white loom, you can say with a good degree of confidence, water did not get into this watch. And that's a very good place to start. So limit yourself to the United States, Japan, and Australia, and look for that white loom and don't buy a watch that someone's restored if you don't know much about them. So it, it really is like a vintage car then, that the vintage car collectors go for the barn finds. Oh, absolutely. That have been absolutely. locked in a dry barn for 40 years or whatever. Oh, yeah. No, absolutely. I'm trying to look for an example here of one that I've got that is a barn find. Um, like this one. This watch here. Okay. This is a 6306-7001. It's the Japanese JDM version of the 6309 Diver. 21 joules and it hacks. This watch I found on eBay and was being sold by the original seller. And he bought this when he was in special forces training to dive in Panama. And he, he took this down to 139 feet. This was his training watch, but it was all scratched up and it was filthy and he'd never cleaned it. And the photographs, you would have just walked away from it. Most people would have said, because it was like the, the bezel between the bezel and the glass was just this just line of filth. But and the crystal was all scratched, but you looked at it and you looked through the crystal and you could see the whiteness of all the hands. And I could see the condition of the in, of the insert. And I was like, that's a good watch. And in fact, it was, it is a good watch. Um, so that's, I mean, there's, there's one of your barn finds right there. Wow. Um, and what a story as well. And what, oh, yeah. what a history to buy with the watch that's, that's yeah, actually and was, lived the And life. I was like, are you sure you want to sell the thing? And but he he parted with it. He says he doesn't dive anymore. Wow. Well, it's cool as well that that was actually used for military because there's a, the amount of like military spec black ops watches that you see now. And you're like, they've never, no, no armed forces would ever use a watch that size or that specification. But Oh, no, no, no. I mean, like I did a little video today where I talked again about some of the special forces watches that were used by the U.S. military in Vietnam, and we have some of them, and they're literally just dress watches. They're 60s dress watches. There's no giant shrouds and weird things and built-in built in laser pointers, none of that stuff. Literally, it's just a watch. What would you say is your favorite Seiko model that, that's been made? Um, my favorite models, though, really are going to be, oh, Lord. Well, of course, there's my 6159, which is which is a lovely piece, which you love. But in terms of a, a watch that I will routinely wear, oh gosh, probably this one, just in terms of sheer beauty and ergonomics. That's a 6105-8110. There's a, a certain kind of perfection about this watch. It's so simple and clean and the lovely ergonomics of it, the, just the unusualness. I mean, most 60s divers, like this came out of the 1960s. Most 60s divers looked a lot like this 62 MAS with the straight with you know, with the with these you know very simple cases. This is a real 60s dive watch, and most of them looked like this. Seiko did some astonishing stuff when they invented this. And in, in the case design, there was nothing ever anything like it before, and there's never been anything like it since. It's an utterly iconic design. It's the reason why these are so valuable. Um, another uh, another one that I really do love a lot, which is actually one of my dailies that I, I wear again without fear, is uh, my seven five four nine Golden Tuna. Yeah, Basil Wolf, They just came out with this again. Wow. So I mean, that's a that's a great point as well. So you've got all three of the the legendary divers that have been recreated. Then you've got that tuna. You've got the the sixty one fifty nine, and you've got the sixty two Mass. Oh, no, 62 MAS. Wow. <laughs> yeah, what a trio. It's, it's, it, you know, it's nuts, though. I mean, because I've been doing this for a long time. I remember one of the first 62 MASs I ever had. I got it, and it had some loom damage, and there was something about it I just didn't like. They had a, there was something about the watch that didn't make me happy, and I, I didn't never bonded with it. I don't quite know why. And I sold it, and I couldn't believe the guy was willing to pay $500 for it. 
mind blowing. I still can't believe you paid that much money for it. But what are they worth now? I see three and four thousand dollars. Yeah. So I mean, what's what is your view on um, those watches originally were like the every man's watch, every, you know, a diver's cross effective. What's kind of your view on the fact that they've been re re released now and they are. You know, to say they're a premium price is probably a, a, an underestimate. You know, they're, they're sort of six thousand five, you know, five thousand six thousand dollars. Some of them. I don't. It blows my mind. I don't really, honestly, I don't understand what Seiko is trying to do uh, with their modern thing. Back in the old days, I mean, we talk about Seiko in Vietnam. Seiko has had a very long and deep connection with our U.S. military. As I said, you could go on base anywhere and buy. Seikos, and they were extremely affordable. And as a result, many, many, many soldiers owned them. I mean, Colonel Pogue of the Pogue Watch fame, he bought on base in Texas, and I think he had to put it on layaway. And I think it was $139 total. And they were within the reach of everybody. And so the reason that Seiko was so successful in the 60s, but especially the 70s, was for this reason in the United States and in Australia, because both United States and Australia were in Vietnam. And so you could get these watches everywhere. You could buy them on leave and everybody came back to the United States. They're like, Seiko's great. I, I, I had it when I was in the service. They're awesome. Every man watches, you could buy them and everybody would wear them. And they were, in, so you would see them on the wrist. Everybody would have them on the wrist out there and had that certain, you know, cachet. Now you're spending $4,000 for a recreation of a watch that cost like $65. Um, and you, no one's ever going to notice it on your wrist and say, wow, the only people who are going to be impressed are the people in your watch groups online. And it's and it's just I, I don't know what their end game is. I don't know what the point is. You think they'd want to I mean, they still sell a ton of inexpensive watches. They still do. But they don't seem to they sort of flip from model to model. They don't. There's only a few models that they continuously make and the rest of them. They just and they've also kind of lost their reputation for durability that they used to yeah. have. So, I mean, I don't know, I don't know what they're thinking. I don't know what they're thinking. I mean, because you know, they have, so they have a recreation of the golden tuna. Um, I don't know how much it's going to be, but you can still get a good golden tuna like this for 1500 bucks. It's not terrible. Why not, why not buy the original? It's a better movement anyway. It just occurred to me, do you think that the Pogue might be the next year's Basel world? It, it, it could be. They have recreated a new chronograph movement that uses the same technology, the, the chronograph wheel with the built-in vertical, vertical clutch. The problem is Seiko generally does not seem to understand their own design legacy. When they recreate these things, they get all this little important critical stuff wrong. Um, I mean, I can talk about the things that they get wrong, but I'm sure that based on what I've seen from them, if they came out with a reissue of the 6139, they would screw it up. There are certain things that make that made that model exquisite and they and they got them wrong. Like with the 62 MAS reissue, there were certain super key things that they screwed up. And as a result, the watch to me just wasn't special. So there's actually something, a common misconception with that Pogue model, I believe. Uh, absolutely. There's sort of some misinformation about it that people um, sort of keep uh, uh, through received wisdom, this sort of bad information has gotten out there and it keeps getting sort of metastasizing out into the world. Some people um, are claim, have claimed and do claim and still claim that Pogue's true model was a 6139-6002. The 6139 says Seiko chronograph automatic on the dial. Seiko chronograph automatic, three lines. The 6002s, the last digit of Seiko models, it denotes where the watch was sold to, what part of the world. Two is Australia and Asia, Southeast Asia. So Pogue bought his watch in the United States in Texas, and his watch did not say chronograph automatic. The North American one is 6139-6005, and it says Seiko automatic. That's the only thing it says on the dial, Seiko automatic automatic it has the sua symbol above the subdial with 17j the 17j is on the us model only and from the photographs of pogue's watch that is what the dial is now some people are going to say well but we we don't know what the case back we have never seen a picture of the case back and i said okay that's fine 
But every piece of evidence that we have for Pogue's watch says 6139, 6005, where he bought it, the time that he bought it, uh, the way that the dial looks, everything else like that. There is not a single piece of evidence that says that it is anything other than a 6139, 6005. That's really useful information. I cover a lot of like space watches on my channel, um, you know, from the Omega. I've even got the Timex. I've got the Fortis. So that's really interesting. It's certainly a model that I've been interested in, like adding to the collection so I can kind of build it out. So going back to the, so we, we, we talked at the start about Seiko movements. Is there anything when you, when you kind of look at a movement, like kind of like design things that Seiko did with the movement that you think just don't make sense? Well, I mean, I, it makes sense from a cost cutting standpoint one of the things because i deal with this particular era of seiko when you had the two main factories which was dany and sua most of what i deal with is the sua product that's the 6139 chronographs 6830 6138 chronographs 6105 divers 6309 divers those things they're all basically from the same template they're modifications of the same template and in that template Seiko decided to save a few pennies per watch. And what they decided to not do was to jewel the upper and lower ends of the mainspring arbor ports. The 6138 has a jewel up in top, but that's only because they can't have any wear there. Because if you have any wear in that top, and you'll, you'll start running out of clearances very quickly. So something I deal with all the time is the, the fallout of the fact that Seiko never didn't preemptively uh, cure this problem. So what happens with these watches, these automatic watches, they wear and they wear and they wear because they're winding all the time. And the mainspring arbor, which is the axle that the entire mainspring barrel turns on, the mainspring arbor is stainless steel, but it sits in a hole in the main plate that is just brass. Brass is softer than steel. So as that mainspring arbor turns and turns and turns, it takes that round hole in the brass and it grinds it out into an oval. And then the whole balance the whole um, mainspring barrel starts to tip and so you start things start coming out of spec and out of clearance and if it gets bad enough the barrel will tip over enough that it starts the edges start hitting the plates and it'll start grinding into the brass the main crates so there was one Seiko in that 6000 family that got jewels top and bottom and that was the 6159 so the 6159 got jewels top and bottom so what old school watchsmiths used to do is they could order just those jewels and they would take those jewels and they would put them in the, in the lower grade models. So that's what we do now, but we had to have the jewels recreated. And so um, I'm actually, I'm just about to go through and put an order in with an American company um, and they're going to have them produced in Switzerland for me. And so I will have a ton of them and I can, you know, really make sure that I never run out because basically Every single one of these watches needs this repair. Every one of them. So will that be just, will you just be boring it out and replacing the thing or are you going to create a movement that, or a, pl a plate that has it in? No, no. no. What happens is, is that you have, a, you have a, a, a thing called a tool called a Zeitz jeweling tool and it has reamers. And so what you do is you, you ream out the lower port, you ream it out to the, to the right width and then you just, it's a friction, friction fit. And you just friction in the lower jewel and then the upper bushing can be replaced. You just pop the bushing out and you put the upper jewel in and then you're good to go. And that's a permanent fix. So, and you know, unless for some reason, you know, the jewel should crack, which is rare, it'll be, you'll be, it'll be done. You'll be set. Is there any of the modern Seikos that you think are going to become uh, sort of classics? Any that you kind of keep your eye on or? Well, I mean, I, I, I can't say enough good things about the Seiko SKX 007. It's the quintessential modern everyman Seiko. It is taking, it has taken the place of kind of what Seiko always used to be. Um, and so I, I think they're really wonderful. But that said, Seiko, they used to be just bulletproof back when Seiko, Seiko used uh, basically say the first generation of those watches used a movement, the 7S movement, which was a version of a movement they've been making for more than 40 years. It is bulletproof and they didn't even change most of the parts the balance uh, assembly is the same for 40 years but then that was the a type but then they changed they moved things around and modified things to the b and the c versions and ever since they did that they're sort of weird and buggy and this is true of the new 4r and the 6r movements there's something wrong with them 
Now, I've heard that Seiko has come out with a D type. So instead of a C now, they're at the D. I haven't seen one and I don't know what they did. So, but you just, you can't, you can't go wrong with it with an SKX 007. They're just absolutely classic. But I would say if possible, if somebody decides they're finally going to pick one up, try to get an old one that has the A type movement. Because if you get the A type movement, they're bulletproof. So uh, there's a lot of hype around uh, Grand Seiko recently. So we know uh, there's kind of, we, the, the argument is that they're incredibly high build quality, but the price reflects that. But also it puts it in a price that many would regard was kind of like Rolex territory or those kind of like premium um, providers. So w what's your view on Grand Seiko? Um, I understand what they're doing. Uh, again, as I talked about earlier, regular Seiko seems to have lost their way from my viewpoint. Um, their, their QC is not that good or they don't care. And so they're kind of, their reputation is becoming tarnished. And many, many people are saying this. I mean, I hear this all the time and people have been saying it for a good number of years now. So Grand Seiko, I think, wanted to move away from that and be able to justify their higher price point. I myself, I mean, I have some luxury watches. I mean, I have my, I have my, you know, my Omega Speedmaster and, you know, I, I have my, my, my Sin ST103 and I, I, I have, you know, I have, you know, nice watches, but, um, but the thing is, is they want to justify, I, I haven't seen one personally. I guess if I went down to a watch shop that sold them and actually got a chance to look at them in person, I would have more of an opinion. I think probably their tech is excellent. I would really want to see, I would want to get one of these new Grand Seikos, one of these mechanical ones. I'm sure the case finishing is astonishingly beautiful. Seiko has always been good at that aesthetic stuff. I would want to get one of these new Grand Seikos and I want to put it, numbers don't lie. I want to put it on the time grapher and I want to see what we find because as with the 62 MAS reissue, the SLA 017, I had a big review, video review of them where I put basically a, a, a nearly new one that had had some wrist time, four thousand dollar watch, and I put it on the time grapher, and it had beat error, and it was inaccurate, and it had low amplitude, and so I want to see if this disease that is afflicting Seiko is something that Grand Seiko is addressing, and that's something I would know more. I think they've got some great designs. If somebody was going to hand me a snowflake, one of the new Grand, Se one of those beautiful dress watches. I'd, I'd be happy to own one, believe me, but I'd want to see what the numbers are. Yeah, that's fantastic. So um, before we finish up here, more importantly, for, for viewers that aren't familiar with you, and uh, certainly for people that want to get hold of you for like um, looking at their watches, how, what, what's the best method and uh, what's the name of the, the business? It's Klein Vintage Watch Repair, and you can go to kleinvintagewatchrepair.com. I am on Instagram at Klein Vintage Watch. Um, there's all kinds of places you, you can find me on Reddit. Uh, I run the uh, Seiko subreddit and also the Japanese watches subreddit. They both belong to me. Um, and you can find me there. I am Seikoholic on Reddit. If in case anybody is bored and wants to sh uh, hunt me up there. Um, but the best way really is going to be to message me through the website. And that comes straight to us. My wife and I both, because she runs half the business. We see that and we'll, we jump right on it. Yeah. Oh, that's brilliant. And it, uh, just uh, what, what a great um, thing that you're doing, keeping these vintage watches alive. Same with that. Uh, I was lucky enough to interview Larry at Uncle Seiko, lovingly recreating the vintage strap. So I think a big thank you from the community there. So as always, guys, um, thank you so much for watching. If you've got any comments, leave them in the comments section down below and I'll try and get back to you as quick as possible. Uh, or you can contact me directly at the uh, casualwatchreviewer at gmail.com. So thanks again, Spencer, and my yeah, pleasure. And I'll and I'll see you all next time on the Casual Watch Review channel. Thanks, guys. Bye.